Good, Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> and welcome to the Thursday, July 7th uh, school committee, regular school committee meeting. Um, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, I'll take a run through our agenda here, and then we will move on. Um, we have our first opportunity for public comment. Then we have our reports to the school committee um, with liaison reports, a school committee chair report, and superintendent's report. Then we move on to new business where we have an overnight intent to travel recommendation, middle school club stipend funds recommendation, Reallocation of VCBA funding, um, moderate needs teacher point four FTE modification, FY, uh, we're going to switch around E and F to take the fiscal year 16 end of year transfers and school lunch negative balances first, and then if need be, we will have a discussion on school lunch price increase. Um, and then we'll move on to the capital project article warrant 16-080. And then we will have old business, which will discuss the revised 2016-2017 school calendar, a um, high school stateside final approval of, intent, um, of a for, former intent to travel we reviewed a few meetings ago. And then we'll have another opportunity for public comment and then items by consensus with adjournment thereafter. And our first opportunity for public comment is now, and there is no one here from the public this evening, so we will move on to reports of the school committee and start with the liaison reports, if there are any. Anybody have any liaison meetings over the last couple of weeks? Um, I didn't get anything from John on ESBC. You guys there was one, but I was out of town. I think okay. he was also. All so. right. And I don't have any information on that. So, and there was the, um, unfortunately, the CPAC meeting that was scheduled for the end of the year um, had to get canceled because there was um, a mix up with the town clerk's office in posting. So we didn't have a meeting either. Um, so I guess we can move on the school committee chair report and I don't believe. So I think we were going to do that first. Oh, you're right. Sorry. I jumped right over the finalizing liaison rules. All right. So, so we I have, have a, that next. Yes, and I have an updated one to hand out. Um, it seems that with, with just somehow the wrong version got into your packet. This one is red. Okay. So... We last spoke about liaison roles, I believe, on the, our May 26th meeting, and we went through most of the roles and assigned most of the roles, but there were a few that we reserved for further discussion. Um, the ones that are still outstanding, it's hard to tell from this because we, we have one well, the TBD is the policy review, and I think what we discussed on May 26th was doing policy over the summer during our um, summer special meetings. But if anyone wants to discuss changing that, we certainly can discuss that one. And the others that were open, I believe, was the Irvine Tadaro was that open? No, no that. it's yeah, Nancy. Yeah. We I had it, don't, it. We didn't have it right. It looks um, like youth youth commission. commission is we have not discussed in 2020. 2020 and turf field. Okay, we're not finalized. Great. All right. So, in terms of the policy review last year, I did just want to discuss it just to make sure that we were all in agreement on how we were moving forward with that. But last year, what Dr. McLeod had suggested was that. We go over as a group what our schedule was, and then we take up the policy in accordance with that schedule as a group rather than having an individual liaison. Um, because it was the year before, it was seeming a bit repetitive. Correct. Um, and so we are taking up 
we, we've already discussed some of the agenda items for our next two summer meetings and policy is included in that so we will then have the opportunity as a group to discuss mm -hmm. some of the, po the policy calendar for the mm -hmm. year and what we have coming up and then also some policy we can get to right away this summer that needs to be done before the start of the school year so unless anyone has a strong opinion on having someone be in that liaison role um, I think Dr. McLeod and my suggestion would be to continue as we did it last year where we took it on as a group, but I wanted to provide everyone the opportunity to speak on it. Yeah, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit confused because I, I feel like last year we started out that way, but then during the course of the year a lot got added and um, I think the only gap that I see is that sometimes laws change and we're required to do a policy and we maybe are not aware of that and you know as school committee members it wouldn't necessarily be on our radar screen to bring it forward so I think what we had talked about at the last uh, the May 26th meeting was going back to or consider going back to the model where and we we took a pause because Dr. Cavanaugh wasn't here yet where we had originally had the assistant superintendent sort of be the driver of that list and we could certainly look through and see what policies are obvious to us that need to be updated but sometimes you know the best example and this is not a recent one was when um, the state required the bullying policy and that was led by the superintendent the assistant superintendent at the time um, and it was quite a comprehensive community process that would not really have been as effectively done if it were led by the school committee so I'm just not sure in the event that how, are, how will we handle things like that that come up during the year that aren't necessarily on the radar screen now when we're doing the planning um, and sort of who will be the driver of that I think this past year it ended up by default being Dr. McLeod and I feel like she's got a lot else that she's driving right now um, so I'm not sure that's the most efficient model so what I can say is that I mean we all received notices from MASC about law changes and that's where I brought up recently our requirement by the beginning of the school year to have um, our drug, drug and alcohol prevention policy in place. So I do think that we get notices and we should bring up things that we see. Um, it's not to say that that's the best stopgap there and I do remember, you're right, the conversation we were having about Dr. Kavanaugh possibly taking that on. Um, I don't know if that discussion has happened. So I don't know your thoughts on that, Dr. McLeod, your thoughts on it, Dr. Kavanaugh. And so um, when Bob left, one of the things that I did when I was reorganizing roles and responsibilities is I took policy off of, off of the, the list, that the long list, um, that is under the assistant superintendent because I wanted the focus to be completely on curriculum curriculum instruction and professional development so later on when we're talking about the strategic plan you will see the many many things that Carol is driving that I think really belongs in her world I feel that our work together as a school committee and superintendent necessarily makes that relationship around policy an important one mm -hmm. um, and not only do you get notified through MASC but I get notified through MASS and additionally whoever is appropriate in this case Karen also reminded me of this the same requirement under MGL for yeah. the opioid so I don't fear that we're going to lose anything I believe that maybe Jean when we when we look at the policy calendar upcoming that we know we need to take on because of legal aspects um, there's a lot of room in there to add things on as because it feels to me like what we've been doing is as things come to our attention that maybe our policy no longer is effective or needs to be changed. Remember we had that long conversation about homeschooling? Mm -hmm. That was because there was a request right. and it made sense to go back and look at our policy and see whether or not it needed to be changed. Um, so, so those kinds of things happen naturally, I suppose. Um, I have reviewed all of the policy since I've been here. Um, and made sure that everything that's on our website is up to date. Um, so I continue to feel that, in, at least when I'm in this role, that, that it feels like it should fall to me. Okay. Um, 
That's fine. I just I, I just want to know that there's, I mean, we all get a lot of email. So who yeah. is the one who is flagging that, I guess? It's it, been me, and it will continue to be me. If Dr. Kavanaugh wants to fight over policy, <laughs> come on on over. Yeah, and I didn't uh, mean please, to put you on the please, spot. Uh, I just, I, tell us what you I, think. Yeah, I'm happy to assume any initiative as it comes down, but I do think that if policy is going to be you know, sort of something that lives with this group, it, it probably should start here, and then anything that comes to me subsequently is fine. I mean, the other example is we had talked about the advertising policy, for example, which is going to be a much broader conversation and a much broader examination of what other districts do and mm -hmm. probably some conversation with the community and that kind of thing. So if this is a separate conversation that we're having later in the summer, that's mm -hmm. fine. But that's, I think, a more comprehensive, and there may be others in that category, that's more comprehensive work than a first reading, second reading, third reading, right. and some that are straightforward or driven by a legal change or whatever. So yeah. um, so maybe that's a conversation better had when we have the entire slate in front of us. Okay. But I, you know, we can't all six of us have, you know, meetings to <laughs> work. So, I mean, I think there are going to be some that are going to be more efficient if a smaller group I can see. work to bring yeah. some, some And in that case, forward. it would be good to have a liaison. Right. I, I and, understand. And it doesn't have to be decided tonight. And maybe yeah. when we have a look at all of the policies, yeah. we can decide if that's a need that we're going to have for this year. But um, well, it, I thought it worked really well in the past when we did it that way. Okay. Um, but if that is, it doesn't fit the needs that we have for the policies that we're going to be reviewing this year, that's So, fine. no, I think it's a good idea. I think what didn't work was the working group. Remember, we had the budget working group and we had the policy working group, and then it just felt like we were doing things. Those of us who were on the working group were doing things twice. Um, but to have a liaison person from school committee who would do, if we come to a policy that needs more extensive work mm -hmm. and involved input from the community, then I think that makes great sense. Yeah. Yeah, and the other point I think that I would add to that is that while I, I don't think it's necessarily wrong for us to update policy when an issue rises to the occasion to draw attention to the issue, because I, I do think the issue generally makes us think about policy in a different way than we yeah. would have when we just look at it with without that issue before you. Yeah. Um, I do feel like we may also want to have a dedicated person strictly from the standpoint of there's quite a bit of policy that's old in yeah. there yeah. and we really haven't we, like the, we, even when I was on the working group we really didn't go back and look at that because that particular right. year we had a lot of policy just to update in Correct. general. Correct, that's true. Um, so it may make sense to do that although I think based on the fact that I know the upcoming meeting we have brought up adver that advertising policy it is going to be mm -hmm. coming up. It may be better conversation for that meeting and also so that we're all here. It, yeah, I think it would be easier to have when we see what, okay. we're, what we're looking at. But I do, you know, I, I understand what you're saying about it being repetitive for, for the people who are working on the drafting. But at the same time, you know, I, I do think sometimes it saves time. Like when, when it was my job, I sort of felt like, my initial pass at it with the assistant superintendent gave that a piece of that community voice that like well or the the sort of user experience uh, uh, this is how these parents would be affected or these students would be affected so that we were able to refine things before we brought them forward the first time um you know so again but that that's relevant to some policies and not others so i think maybe having this discussion tabled until we have the context of okay. the policies we're looking at would be helpful. Okay. I mean, that one isn't like a voting one or another group isn't impacted, so I think right. that's okay to have that one held off until the next meeting, and mm -hmm. unless anyone has a dying desire to raise your hand for that one right this second. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, okay. So we'll table that one, but we'll keep it flagged, mm -hmm. and we'll maybe add that discussion to the next agenda as we'll well. We'll do. Yep. Um, the Youth Commission. Yes, I don't know. Jean and I had a conversation about the differences between the coalition and the commission, and maybe you could, for the good of the group, Well, I think when we that. discussed it last time, we, we just took a pause so that I could clarify whether it was necessary to, for the same person to be on the coalition and on the Youth Commission. And so I did speak to the... Um, the youth services director and she felt that that was not 
not uh, required. So, um, so that said, I enjoy being on the Youth Commission, but they, I have a conflict with every single meeting that they have, and so that's not really helpful for them. Um, so they meet the second Tuesday of the month. So I won't be able to continue doing that. Um, in the evening. That piece in the evening, usually at set like seven at the fire station. Um, uh, but I will continue on the coalition. And the coalition is not a liaison role. Yeah, it's not, a, right. Yeah. I would take on the youth commission if nobody else wanted to. Okay. Great. All right. Can I um, introduce the next two items? Uh, sure. So the next two items I wanted to call out separately from the, the, other, the rest of the discussion because they are both new. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about the purpose. Um, for example, when we came out of the last town meeting and we talked about and, and you voted um, around the turf field item, there was some discussion at that point about the importance of having a school committee member be part of that work and that it should be broader than and this is where it gets different from most of the work that we do at the schools. So there's already been some work happening at the high school clearly. There's a committee that's been formed but it seems that what is needed next is a an understanding of what the goal is for a to be formed yet to be formed committee. There actually isn't one yet other than what we have at the at the school. And similarly, although the 2020 committee has been formed, I'm not sure that I fully understand what their interest is in terms of what would the role of the school committee and the superintendent be on that committee. What is it again? Um, so the 2020 committee, and Jean, please jump in, is a committee that really came out of the work of the Chamber of Commerce. And, and it also came from the visioning committee mm -hmm. that happened a few years ago, where the idea was to have some oversight to the many initiatives and the many projects and the many different departments within the town. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. I think so, yeah. And, and but, to attract more, I think, business to the town. But I remain uncertain as to what the roles are, what what the purpose is, what how uh, us serving on it, other than to come back and inform the school committee as a liaison, this is what's been happening with the 2020 committee. So I wonder if we should leave those two committees for the discussion. It's really similar. What's the role? What's the expectation? What's the need? Let's identify what that is first and then determine moving forward. Do we even know when they meet? Well, there isn't a they yet. There's a 2020. Do you know when they meet, Jean? I don't. I, I did talk to Tim Kilhoff, and he would like to have a school committee person. I, I think, I'm not sure if they, well, I don't, you might know better than I do if they're goals for the year are mapped out I have the sense that they are not no but um but given that the primary reason that people move to this community is is our great school system I think that it's a voice that they feel like should really be represented um and an impact you know I mean things impact us as an example the center for the arts application yes. or you know the new um development on Lumber Street and things like that so um, I think as far as us being able to, whomever it is being able also to report back to the school committee yeah I, I feel like sometimes things are just not on our radar screen that have a big impact like the um, like the Muse development is that the name of it not that mm -hmm. that was related to the 2020 per se but just um, the more that we can be out and keeping our yeah, ears what's to the coming ground, along. Yeah. Um, help us be prepared for what students we're going to be receiving and, and what their needs are going to be. So, mm -hmm. um, so from that perspective, I mean, I think it would be helpful. But I, yeah, I don't really know beyond what you've said, what their schedule right. or goals or work. Well, would you like really me to reach out be? to Tim before our next meeting on the sure. 21st of July, which is when we had planned to talk more about policy um, and get more information on that? Yeah. And then maybe all three of these, um, Nancy has volunteered for the Youth Commission, but the other three, the policy review, turf field in 2020, could wait until... I well, think so if there isn't a committee on the 2021, why wouldn't No, there we, is. There, uh, there's actually a set committee, like there's people right. on it? Oh, there yeah. are. Oh, okay. Because I was like, if the committee's not formed... No, yet, it is. It's the turf field committee that's not formed. 
Oh. Because I feel like, well, then, why would we have a liaison set for a committee that's not yet formed? Right. So the turf field is, I mean, the 2020 is, and I will find out more information about whether they have their goals developed, what their timelines are. Um, I know that I've also been asked to participate in that and uh, is probably, as we get to my goal setting, going to be something that replaces chamber because it seems more relevant. Right. Um, but we'll talk well, about that. Well, that'll help you understand, <laughs> yeah. decide that. Yeah. Um, regarding the turf field, I think when we have that conversation, um, it strikes me as comparable to the work that we did on the calendar committee. Like, I, I think it probably needs to be set up as as an advisory committee to the school committee probably needs to be public meetings have minutes kept and all of that um, because ultimately it's going to lead us to a request for money or not um, from the town and I think it's a you know it's going to impact obviously our facilities use policy and just mm -hmm. a lot of but it's it's going to have to be um, a collaborative effort across a lot of different departments but obviously if it's located on the schools we need to be it's a good a idea arbiter of mm -hmm. that decision okay so do you want to bring this discussion back to the 21st of July um sure I mean I don't know it did I mean obviously we'll have more information on policy and it seems like we'll have more information on 2020 but the turf field one Who's running it? Like, who's well, heading that committee? I think, I think, I think it needs to be. My opinion is that it needs to be driven by us, by the school department, um, but that we should be reaching out to, across the town to different interested parties and have, as you say, much like the calendar committee, people um, participate who have an interest in a turf field in our town, mm -hmm. um, while maintaining control over. Okay its use I mean, clearly, and and we have a brand new athletic director right and that she's she has already started yep yeah with with her about so clearly they'd be part of it but it would be it would go beyond the walls of the school and I think be much more successful therefore in telling our story at town meeting if we've done that work during the year okay so should we have a broader discussion on that one planned where we actually talk about who in the community we think should be involved. I think so. Um, yeah, I think, you know, whether or not we have a board of selectmen mm -hmm. liaison and all mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So that feels like an agenda item unto itself. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. So those were the only goals that I believe were outstanding. I mean, we filled the Youth Commission, we have policy, turf, in 2020 to discuss again. Okay. Um, but none of those are holding up any other committees that we know of at this point so and we have gonna... voted everything that we need to as far as right. tech and okay. um, Irvine Tadero great great okay I still have no school committee chair <laughs> <laughs> um, there hasn't there hasn't been any communications out there to let you know about that I've had to respond to it's been relatively quiet I don't want to knock on wood um, so I don't have any report, so I can move on to the superintendent's report. I wanted to um, begin by um, making sure that everybody is aware of the planning board meeting on Monday night, um, this coming, the 11th, 7.30, for the purposes of discussing the new school building. Oh. And so um, I have been involved in a working group meeting. There's been a lot of discussion around some of the questions that have been brought forth by the planning board. Um, people are very well prepared and have met numerous times around the kinds of things that they want answered. Um, I think our OPM is doing a fabulous job of coordinating everything. Uh, there is an issue uh, or a, um, a concern that's been raised around whether or not there would be a road going through the property that would be open and it has been recommended um, by the chair of the planning board. When we met most recently with ESBC or the working group and we had, it was our safety review um, um, portion of the meeting, the police department vocalized their concerns around 
and I shared them very strongly around having a road that would be open. Basically, it would be the road between EMC and the parking lot at the, at the school um, for the benefit of the town being able to jointly share parking. So that will be discussed at length. The um, Jay Porter, who attended our meeting, will be there on Monday night to represent the police department. And um, I wanted to make sure that you were all aware of that. So, um, I know that John is planning on attending as well. Any questions? Want to know more about so that? So yeah. are you talking about the difference between a road versus like an access road exactly. that's closed? Exactly. This would be a permanent road. So right. the way it's designed with the way the school, it would lead right into the playground. Right. I thought it had always been discussed as an access road. It so was. Now it's, this so is, now the, the it planning had been. board is recommending? It has to do with parking, shared parking. I think it also has to do with conversations with the, the uh, Upper River Upper Charles River Trail. So there's been a lot of different discussions. And then the um, Irvine Tadero, I don't know if it came up in that committee, but just what's going to happen with the rest of that property. Um, but, I mean, if we think about our other school campuses, we don't have active roads going through any of them. Um, and as we discussed at the working group, we understand about m monitoring traffic can be as simple as putting a sign at the end of the driveway that says parking lot is full mm -hmm. and then and then the other access is used so I think it's great all of these discussions are happening people are very invested in this new property and really being thoughtful about its uses mm -hmm. and and I just wanted and and a, and a lot of um, very collaborative meetings have taken part across departments around it so I want you to be aware thank you um, Next, the strategic plan is in your packet, and it's there um, for anybody watching uh, who want to have access to it. It's been posted along with the agenda. Um, I wanted to bring the school committee's attention to the um, basically the formatting. The formatting is one which we've been, so this is now year three um, of our strategic plan. And each year, we are calling out the specific objective and the priority initiative for the year. What's really important um, as we've worked together is to prioritize the responsibility around each of these initiatives. One of the things I really love about our strategic plan is the fact that it allows us to design our school improvement plans, align our school improvement plans, and then our individual goals. So you will see me reference the strategic plan when we do our, my goal setting at the next meeting. And likewise, in the summer when we meet with the admin retreat, all of the administrators will be, will be having this document in front of us as we set our goals. So it really is um, driving the work of the district. But it also helps us to look at roles and responsibilities and making sure two things. One is that we're not overlapping and have multiple people with the same responsibility. And then two is that we can really focus. And you'll see um, at, at places in this document where it calls out parents, students, and teachers. This is something that is their primary responsibility. Um, so the first um, theory of action around effective school leadership Really, the majority of that, as you will see looking down, um, falls to the admin council and central office. These are things that administrators will be part of the work, but is not their primary responsibility. That is more driven from central office, from Karen and Carol and I <coughs> and Ralph um, and Ashok. We are the drivers of, of this effective school leadership part of the, um, of the plan. Um, so the strategic plan, we're just on, it, you can see that it's the school improvement plans have been aligned and under that first bullet on page three that it's complete for 2016-17 because they've all come to you with their school improvement plans and they've been approved and, but I just wanted to reinforce the process came from, from here. Um, under the targeted professional development and technology plan, we are really excited for the first time to be starting our year and I know we've talked several times through the year about people in the community wanting to know well what does happen on a day when our kids are at home and so we will have a published professional development plan that you will be able to see across the district who's doing what how it's aligned um, it's work that we've been doing um, through central office at, through our learning design team and that's the people that you see here my in including Ashok um, who really look at how is the professional development plan aligned with our strategic initiatives? Do we make, do we have enough professional development on new initiatives, and 
or do we have too many initiatives? So we discover that by developing a professional development plan. Did you want to comment on it at all? No, just to say that I have, in fact, been meeting with principals individually as well to sort of get um, their their teachers in place for what's going to happen at the beginning of the school year, but also what will be taking place in January because we really want to have something concrete in place that's year long where we can sort of see how the professional development will evolve according to teacher and student needs. Um, very much, um, I think, data driven so that as we look at, at student progress as we go, we'll be able to modify things um, you know, in January and March and, and then even be in a better place for next year. And Karen, you've been doing the same. Yes across the departments within the various domains of related service providers what type of professional development we're going to offer and we've actually uh, already worked last year at the end of last year to uh, begin to align our goals directly to the strategic plan with professional development to follow so we're yep. pretty excited about it's that. It's great. It's really great. And we had the administrators at our we had our first day of our retreat in district and um, just heard people especially people who have been here for a while say we've been really needing this this is fantastic and appreciative of the work. Um, under the Collaborative Culture Open to Dialogue and Trust, this is ongoing. We have John Doria coming back to work with us not only this summer, so he's, he is basically the director of Te Teachers 21. Um, he's a wonderful lecturer and, and professional development provider, and we worked with him two summers ago, and we were just delighted. So we've asked him to come back for the first day of our retreat this year with the focus on reducing stress while maintaining high expectations. So we want to be able to have that conversation that says we are, you know, a high performing district. We have high performing, high expectations for all students. We're really looking at closing the gap for students who are not where we want them to be. But at the same time, we're talking a lot about reducing stress and that begins with us. That begins in central office and filters down to the buildings and obviously down to the kids. Um, so he's going to start our day with that, but then we're very excited. He's coming back on August the 30th to meet with the teachers. Mm. Uh, he's going to meet with the secondary teachers in the morning and the elementary in the afternoon. And so we feel like the message that begins with the, ad, the administration is going gonna, is gonna to filter down to the teachers, or I won't say down, across, filter across to the teachers. Um, and then we have contracted with him to continue his work with us on four different occasions throughout the year. So he will come back and he said to me, you know, it's really great. I get to meet with administrators. I get to meet with school departments in the summer and everybody's relaxed and everybody's excited and then the year starts and it's really easy to get caught up in all sorts of other things. And so he likes this model of coming back repeatedly throughout the year. We've, we've booked already four different two-hour visits with us with the admin council um, and then he's also available to us on a consulting basis by phone. So we're very excited about that but this is this whole collaborative culture that we've been really working hard to develop and, and I believe um, that that we we are there. Um, can I can I ask you one quick question, or just is occurring to me? I wonder if the PTA might be able to sponsor him to come and talk with parents as well, because mm -hmm. we have so much conversation around this in the community, and um, you know they've been great. Or there's you know even in the high school PTA budget, there might be room for this. Um, I don't know if that's his particular if that's an audience that he works with or if he could recommend somebody no. but I just what a great theme for everyone thank you I think that so so you know we now have a parent uh, parent education coordinator who I met with with the HTA HPTA and she wants to be able to be that person that coordinates ongoing professional, not professional development, educational opportunities for parents. So last year we had the reading series, we mm -hmm. had a behavior workshop, we had a math manipulative. She is going to coordinate that. And I, I met with her two weeks ago and asked her to begin her work by doing a survey. Yeah. I said, find out what people want, but also when do they want it? Because we know people are asking for things and then they don't, you go and there's no one there. Um, and we believe it's just because we haven't found the exact right time. So she's going to do that. I will add that to the list. I think that's a fabulous suggestion. Yeah, and, and I do think, you know, given that he's going to be working with every other faction of our district. Yeah, I think, I think it would be yeah. great. Okay, thank you. Because, you know, <laughs> yep. you can't fix every problem. If parents have to be on board. Right. Um, 
underlined curriculum, you will see um, this is this is the curriculum work. This is the work that's happening that Carol is leading, um, that she's working across di across um, content areas and departments. Um, there's going to be a lot of work with Ashok around a curriculum mapping tool to replace Atlas. Um, a focus, as you can see in the middle of page five, on, the, on preparing for the new science standards. We very much know that that's in the forefront. Um, Karen and I, you can see Karen and the learning specialists in the chairs are going to be working directly, Karen and I together, on this aligning resources to provide a modified specialized curriculum within and between classrooms. So that's a project that Karen has built the foundation for in her work in the past year. Um, we, have, we have gathered a wonderful resource binder, as you heard us address at CPAC, and now the next step is making sure that we match the right resources with the right students, with the right instructional pacing, and that we are um, making adjustments as we go. So that's a big focus of what we're going to be doing um, this year. Um, then under Strategic Objective 2, articulate what proficiency looks and sounds like. This is where we are now ready. When you look at the five-year plan, this was right here, smack in the middle. And now it's, it, now it's the year to take this on in terms of looking at um, the instruction that's taking place. What does proficiency look and sound like? Um, and, and beginning to really provide more opportunities for critical thinking. Shall I move on? Okay. Sure. Effective instruction. Um, you've heard us talking about this. We're going to continue to talk about it, which is using student assessment results to establish high expectations. I alluded to it earlier. It's just an ongoing uh, piece that we are going to be continuing with um, to plan enrichment, remediation, and adjust practice in response to de data analysis. And the most important part of that phrase is the last one. Um, and so for this year, that will be we're in good shape. We've got the data. Um, and, and really planning not only um, what the response is, but we've been working with actually our new assistant principal who comes from a district with, with a, a great coaching background in math um, and with Carol and with Ashok to find some interventions, some, some targeted individualized interventions for students that also have a data component to them and, and track on an individual basis how students are performing. Uh, and we're very excited about some changes that we're making. Maybe I'm ahead of myself when we get to assessment. So on this page, on page seven, you now can see this is really going to be the focus for teachers, for principals, this ongoing work with data analysis and targeted instruction. And that's intentional to so that we can really let teachers feel focused on what they're doing and not wondering what the next initiative is going to be. Um, we've worked very hard to, to do that. Implement evidence-based high-quality instructional practices. Again, that's more of the same. Um, but specifically on page 8, you can see called out that Karen and Lauren have already been working with a consultant and will continue to work to it with a consultant around the preschool program recommenda recommendations and um, putting those, those recommendations into practice. Anything more on that? Under student assessment, we have a lot of assessments <laughs> in this district. And that's both a blessing and a curse. The conversation that we've been having as an admin team, and we finalized the conversation last week, was to say, what are the assessments that we're using what are the ways in which we're using them? Which ones are effective for driving instructional decisions? And which ones do we feel we're asking students to, to do? It's taking a lot of time, and there's really not been a great impact. So we have come to some, some conclusions around some of the things that we've been doing, that we've been doing just because we've been doing them. But in adding on more assessments, what we haven't been doing is taking any away. So we had a, a great discussion and made some decisions last week around um, some of the, the assessments that have been here for five years. Um, Galileo was one that came up. Um, and, and we had the discussion in conjunction with the fact that the high school is going to be opening their grade book all the time. It's going to be open at all, every day. So this will allow access to grades, but we want to make sure that the grades are understandable and that they, they are 
readily interpreted. So when I said that we were going to bring in some tools that will help us to track students on an individual basis, these are the students that fall in the high needs category. These are the students that we want to make sure that we want to really be tracking to make sure that what we're doing with them is, is helping them move forward and if it's not, that we don't continue with, with it for months on end, that we make some changes. Some of the tools help us to do that. And um, so this is the balanced system of assessments. I feel like we've been working on this now since the beginning of the strategic plan, and I'm feeling really good about where we are with having that balance in place. Um, using learning data, you see that under assessment results again. Um, and in that particular area on page 10, we ha now have an EL coordinator. You approved an additional position to the to the uh, budget as well for second language learning, and that allowed Jill Kimball to take on more of a coordinator role. Um, and you've been working closely with Jill. Yes. Um, so, really looking at their learning plans, uh, uh, providing professional development, and then also the ongoing training of teachers who need to um, have the SEI, SEI endorsement in place. So we've contracted with her to provide an additional in-district training um, so that teachers can have their training right here and it's accessible and at no cost to them. Um, finally, educators support students. This is, oh, so this is the student piece. This is having students be part of their developmentally appropriate goals. This is making sure students understand how, how they got the grade they got and how they, what they need to do if they want to improve that grade. Um, so really involving student goal setting and high expectations. Um, Karen, could you just, on page 10, I, know, I don't know if you have it in front of you, uh, we call out the transition planning and implementation, and it says the responsibility is Karen and the secondary chairs. This is probably a perfect time for you to talk a little bit about that. Sure. So the transition planning and implementation. So transition planning is a very big initiative among the Department of Education, and it involves students that are aged 14 and up are, by law, obligated to um, be part of their IEP process and transition plan. Basically, the, the goal is to prepare them for adult life so they can be productive citizens in, in a society. Um, and so what I've uh, proposed to the team and work with the admin council and central office leadership team is that uh, we really work to enhance our practices in this area. I know that when I was hired, that was actually a question when I was interviewed as to what would I do to help students um, you know, in this category. And I am true to my word in that I really believe we have to give students the best opportunity to be successful. So this work, um, this does tie into my request tonight, um, will help us be able to enhance the students to have opportunities to learn not only in the classroom but outside of the classroom so they can learn how to successfully transfer skills that are learned in the classroom into real adult world situations. So that's the goal. Thank you. And then the final section, it kind of brings us full circle to the conversation, Jean, that you brought us to around, around um, strategy, uh, sorry, around policy. Because this is the leadership governance and communication part of our work. And as you can see under uh, Evaluate and Develop School Committee Policy, I have indicated that that would be the responsibility, our joint responsibility, school committee and superintendent. Um, I've listed some already that have, are, will be taken up um, for 2016-17. These have already been put on the calendar that you will see on the 16th. Um, but to your point, there, there could be others that have much more of a community impact. Um, and so that work is, is one under, that's objective two. And that objective one really is the facilities and budget um, process. And all of these uh, under responsibility I really intentionally, obviously we need the administrators to be part of the budget process, but we really do try to minimize the impact it has on their work so that they can focus on those areas that I've called out that we want them to focus on. So you see the people mostly, um, all central office, have the primary responsibility in these areas. In this way, the, te the principals can really focus, principals, administrators, teachers, and um, students can really focus on, on theory of actions two, three, and four. So curriculum instruction and student assessment. So questions or comments? Does anyone have anything? 
I will just say you said it was going to be a living document, and yeah. you're true to your word. So that's, it, it's great. I just I really like how consistently everything is tied back to this document. It helps everybody focus, including us. And so I don't necessarily understand every single word of it because of the educational pieces of it. But no, I, I just I think that that really helps us separate the wheat from the chaff. There's so much on everybody's plate. So I think this is great, really good work. I feel that it really helps us in decision making when something comes down the pike. We can ask, where does this fit in? Right. Does this have to be in place tomorrow? If not, then we're not even going to we're not even gonna, going to be distracted by it, mm -hmm. because if it isn't something that is part of what we've we've committed to, um, and and I feel like in some ways it's also a good thing for us to all come back to when requests come up randomly, unexpectedly. Um, from the community over something that becomes a priority. I think it helps us to go back to these are the things that we're focusing on this year and great idea and something that we really should be thinking about but this is the this is the timeline that really is a reasonable one for us to take that on. So the only question that I have was in regards to um, when you were looking as a group at the assessments and the number of assessments that are being done and looking at refining that mm -hmm. Um, how, how, and I, and I don't know from not being fully up through all the schools yet, you know, how the assessments are communicated currently to parents that are being done during, throughout the year, but how are we communicating the changes in the assessments? Like, okay, so this, this year your student's in X grade and they will be receiving these assessments so that parents are aware of changes because they either may have students that have prior gone through schools and be expecting them to have something that's no longer happening and maybe not know the reason behind it but and I and I don't and I don't mean it in any like so they can second guess why you're changing the assessments because I, I fully feel that our team is very capable of making those decisions but I feel like it would really be great for parents to know that we're actually looking at the fact that they may be being over assessed in some areas mm -hmm. and that we've decided to pull back because we feel like these areas are more important and so I would just encourage us to think about maybe communicating that in some way and I don't know if it's if it's the open house nights when we you know when we are in the building with the parents those parent nights or what it is but I think that you either have parents that are totally new to assessments as their kids are growing and going into new buildings or you have parents that have had older students go through assessments and now have a student that's in that grade and are wondering why they're not being assessed on that. So um, I just would encourage that thought process as well. Sure. You, you feel like I moment? can already tell. You can tell. I can tell so when she, she was ready. <laughs> <laughs> Surely. So as we have been and as Dr. McLeod indicated, we met in this room a couple of weeks ago and we really talked about um, our our tendency to overassess. And as she said, we have continued to add assessments to our practice, but we haven't taken any of them away. So when we looked, for example, at math assessment, we saw that some people were using Ames Web, some people were using Galileo, we obviously have MCAS assessment, and then we decided that we needed to look at those things and say, well, what are they telling us? And they weren't really telling us what we wanted to know, and then once we had some data, we didn't exactly have the tools that were going to kind of mine data on the 20% of our population who were sort of struggling or underachieving. So what we've looked at is an online tool where every child would be assessed three times a year for about 40 minutes. So really, this is not going to take more than an hour and a half to two hours for every child. And as long as we see that they're progressing where they should be, those children will just go on with our regular curriculum. And then we have another program where if you are part of a 20% of kids who are underachieving, we have 75 seats where we can move students in. They, and it's an adaptive program, meaning if I'm in the third grade but my math skills are at second grade, this will continue to work with me at a second grade level until I achieve third grade status. So that's kind of exciting. And then we also have that one will end at grade five and then we'll have another tool that will do the same in middle school. And the first tool I talked about will give us an MCAS equivalent. 
So it will tell us if you have a student who is achieving at this particular level. When he takes an MCAS test, he should probably be at about a 252 proficient, for example. And so we really will have a very good idea of where our students are in that sense. So we can get rid of costly things like Galileo that have been taking a lot of time, so we're assessing and assessing and assessing without getting the very specific data we want. So that's the kind of excitement. I'm it, excited. It, we are excited. And um, to answer your question, I think what came to mind immediately and I wrote down was initially an overview kind of, I feel like an assessment newsletter, like in, in the overview that Carol just, just articulated, and then what does this look like at my school? Mm -hmm. And our principals, I know that our parents read the principals' newsletters and that that is a really great source mm -hmm. of information. Yeah. So there's a lot coming at parents at Back to School Night. I feel like having something like this in a newsletter where parents can ask questions, what assessments can I expect? What are they for? Why didn't my child get that assessment, the one that Carol just called out? Well, because this is how it's going to be used. And then the last example I'll add to this discussion, because it was brought to, as part of the school improvement plan that, that Vanessa and Tim talked about, was the over-assessing um, happening at that building around just end of unit tests and how those tests were being used for grading purposes. So that has morphed into our homework committee um, that is looking at how much homework and how much of this is preparing for these kinds of tests that are then ultimately resulting in a grade. So the whole thing fits together very nicely and but I'm thinking that's my first reaction to an initial mm -hmm. way of communicating these changes um, in terms of the overview and then breaking it down by building. Well, and I don't know if this is too, adds too much work, but if, if we could have, you know, before a meeting, maybe not a public forum, but a public presentation, just kind of a K to 12 overview, um, I think, you know, people can watch it, will certainly be reported on, people can watch it um, play back on, on HCAM. Um, and that would help us understand too, the whole, the whole, K to 12 picture of it because sure. I think what I'm also really hearing out of this is a highly increased level of consistency um, that that is going forward that may not have existed looking backwards too. I think that those are both so, great ideas. I think having the overview that will then be some sort of a PowerPoint presentation that can then be put on the website in addition to a newsletter. Because I, I think this is great work and again goes so far towards the whole discussion around stress for yes. staff, for students, yes. for parents, for uh, you all, for everybody. Right. So great. And I think you're getting at something important about our balance of stress and rigor. So if we know right. that a child needs work in just geometry skills or just number sense, we can target that instruction without giving that child just an onerous amount of work around mathematics. So we can give that child the rigor he needs, but also take away some of that stress. Mm -hmm. And that would be an amazing Right. So thing. the message isn't that I'm bad at math. It's that I need to work more on geometry or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Anybody else? No? I also um, had indicated in the agenda that I would be prepared tonight to report back on where we stand with um, the possibilities of increasing recess. And I'm very happy to report that um, our wonderful elementary principals have worked their magic. Um, the timing was great because, the, you know, when we started having these conversations with the community, we had yet to look at next year's um, schedules. And so at the kindergarten level, there will continue to be two recesses um, a day, mandatory. Um, the principals and teachers have certainly gotten a very clear message about recess and discipline. Um, I would think that, that that problem has been very quickly taken care of. Um, and then first grade will have 20 minutes. So she has been able to increase their recess time. Her plan, um, is to, once she's in the new building, and I'm just going to read this from Lauren, once in the new building, her goal will be to have recess prior to lunch, aiming for two lunch sessions. And potentially, and this is something that we are going to be able to do next year at the Hopkins School, I just love the idea of separating the two. That's two movement breaks. Mm -hmm. It's two opportunities to get up, move around, get out of the classroom, instead of having it smack in the middle of the day, everything together, sometimes too much time. So at the Hopkins School, 
Um, they are, that is exactly what Vanessa Bellello has been able to do in her scheduling work. And the students will have, recess will not be associated with lunch, will not be connected to lunch. They'll have a separate 30 minute lunch. They'll go to the cafeteria. They'll be supervised while their teachers have a 30 minute uninterrupted lunch. And then she has things in place, plans in place like um, having some activities in the cafeteria where the kids can have some movement breaks. What's the name of the program I was telling you today? It's something that they put. Um, it's not going to. No. Yes, it's Go Noodle, go noodle. and it it's, it <laughs> just it just motivates the kids to just follow the directions and move around. Um, that is certainly not. Um, it's not movement that is is it's certainly directed um but it's at least movement and then the kids will come back at either another time either in the morning or in the afternoon to have a separate recess break that won't be associated with lunch um the other thing that we and and at the elmwood school similarly uh they she has also she meaning mrs carver being able to increase the uh, recess to 20 minutes so i think that's a good beginning um, within the constraints that we have that I've shared with you prior. Um, but the other area where we're looking at unstructured play is really, again, associated with the homework discussion. Mm -hmm. So if students are going home and they have an inordinate amount of homework and it's frustrating to them and there's stress resulting from it, um, that takes away from opportunities for unstructured play at home. And so we began that conversation. I had a couple of these, a the, uh, few people coming to the superintendent's coffee and we had the conversation around, there just isn't time for unstructured play at home anymore between activities and, and then homework. So I believe that these two areas, um, especially, well, primarily at the elementary level are really con connected, mm -hmm. so. Can I just ask a question? So it, it, is Hopkins also going to be a 20 minute recess? Or yes. Is it, okay. How are we updating the recess committee on those changes? Oh, so um, I'm now, I'm now I am confusing the homework committee. We have a homework committee and surveyed, we had 900 responses. Wow. So the homework subcommittee, which is Josh and me and Anne, um, are going to sort through that and come up with a summary which will, I will be reporting out. As far as the recess, um, the there isn't a committee. Not the committee, I, I didn't, I meant the group that mm. approached us. Or I know well, they've reached out asking for updates. And yeah. Just wondering. So I guess this is my update. Okay. If the school committee would like me to put something in writing that can then be shared um, with interested people that, because I know you certainly received a lot of interest and I, as did I, um, I don't have a direct contact with with maybe the entire group but um, I'm happy to put together what I just said to you in in a written format that could then be to just be shared. a listserv yeah I, was I mean, say if it went out to the entire district I think it would be helpful so that it, everybody can get it and then separate groups can share it within themselves so I'm wondering should it come from me or should it come from the principals in their back to school opening I, I feel like this is owned by the principals mm -hmm. and yeah that could be it, a newsletter item as well I f maybe that would be because it really only affects K five. Mm -hmm. So then that maybe makes more sense to keep it specific to each school. I'd rather it not feels like a top down, but rather that mm -hmm. that this, this is something that the principals embraced and made happen um, based on what they they agreed was a concern. Okay, we'll do it that way. I'll ask the principals to communicate the changes in their newsletter. Okay. I'm done. Okay. Is, is oh. there going to be, I'm sorry, just one follow-up sure. question. Is there going to be any, um, is this the end of the issue with the recess or is that going to continue to be looked at as the year goes on? So Nancy, great question. I feel that within the constraints of our time on learning requirements, um, there isn't a lot more wiggle room unless we start looking at changes to per perhaps specials. So I was really looking to the school committee to see if somewhere, and maybe this comes up again when we're talking about my goal setting, um, 
whether or not this is something that somehow fits into an ongoing discussion around social emotional health and wellness. But at this point, I don't have any directive to take it any further, um, but would certainly be willing to look at <coughs> if that's if that's what you would like. I don't mean you, Nancy. I mean the school committee. <laughs> <laughs> Kavanaugh would like, yeah, no, but I just, I, I'm willing to, I just feel, you know, it did come out, it, it came, it was a little unexpected. Sure. Um, and I feel really good about what we've been able to respond to in a, very quickly. Um, whether or not that's enough, um, when I looked at the comparisons that they provided me on the chart, 20 minutes seems to be a common amount of recess when you compare the length of our school day. So some of the school districts had, that had longer recess breaks or multiple recess breaks also had a longer school day mm -hmm. um, which means a lot of money because then we have to pay our teachers to be here for a longer school day so I think the length of the school day and the required time on learning are the two areas that we have to operate within um, we can't shorten lunch is it so it, this is something that had, it was in the back of my mind kind of back to when the whole thing came up is it yeah. something that maybe the individual school councils would be a better place to look at rather than this group here anyway I think there are budget implications to any further changes so I do think this is the group okay and school council kind of comes after budget so yes no I see where it, you know it's it's length of school day it's specials um, taking reducing the amount of time you know 30 minutes at something versus 40 and then having an additional 10 minute movement break somehow I mean those are mm -hmm. I'm only this is just off the top of my head I haven't I haven't really looked into it any further than that um, any further than the scheduling implications that the principals have helped us with well and I think we also need to give it time to right. see how it all progresses you know I mean I, I think that the principals have built this into their schedules, but we haven't seen it in action and seen the impact or, you know, seen passing time and all of those things that were being discussed at that forum that we had. I think I think it would be a bit premature for us to look any further until we see how it actually impacts their days mm -hmm. and what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously the school day, teacher contract, all of that are huge things that we as a district would have to have a much broader conversation than just about recess. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I think you actually bring up a good point, though. How do we think that we will know if this is helping, like by lengthening the recess? I think. Is it? I think it's grassroots. I think it's the children going home. Right. <laughs> okay. And talking about you know, longer recess that they felt frustrated. Yeah that they spent the whole time lining up or that they didn't have a chance to play on whatever they wanted to play on because it, you know just when it was going to be their time turn it was time to come in right. or well and I think that's how it started and how right. you so know people got engaged and how it came to us and so I think um, we will certainly continue to hear about it if you know if it continues to be a struggle but it sounds to me that the principals thought as creatively about this as they could within the constraints that we have and any other changes that would be made would impact related arts and then we're going to hear from a whole nother group right. or sure. additional people I mean you know we can't cut into academic time right. I don't think um, without giving this a try first to see you know and, and it's not going to be a perfect world um, you know if we can't have recess all day long. Well, and, the <laughs> other, to learn something. and the other point is, is that in sitting in that group, the major sour spot of that meeting was the disciplinary use of right. recess mm -hmm. and taking it away. So I, I think that about 50% of the concerns were alleviated with that change in, and I don't think it was a change in policy, but that... Um, directive policy. of what really is supposed to be occurring and and I think you know I think actually that was probably the most upsetting to a lot of parents is having their child come home and say well because so-and-so did something today we didn't get to go outside and I you know that's yeah. frustrating yeah. so I think I think starting the school year with not having that mm -hmm. 
in play mm -hmm. is going to be a big change as well. So, I mean, certainly, I do I think it's the end of the discussion? No, I think it'll come up again. But I think that in terms of, I think we'll hear about it <laughs> naturally um, and be forced to look at it possibly again. But in light of what they've done so far, you know, I can't. Yeah, I, I would also um, really welcome the opportunity to have a conversation that looks at how we can jointly, parents in school together, create more opportunities for unstructured learning mm -hmm. time. Um, because, and, and I honest, and I'm serious when I say that the homework discussion is very much related. Right. Mm -hmm. Because if we are providing homework for the right reasons at, at the right amount of time and giving kids choice which is what we talked about yesterday about tasks that can be either more enriching or practice um, then there should be more time for unstructured play mm -hmm. and I think the conversation goes hand in hand because it doesn't make logical sense to me that that unstructured play happen within the structure of the school day correct necessarily so um, I don't think the conversation is over, but I feel very good about the beginning. So. Okay. Um, okay, great. We will move on to new business. And our first item is the high school stateside overnight intent to travel recommendation. Dr. McLeod. Yeah, this is, again, a repeat. This is Model UN. It's hosted by um, Boston College at Copley Square and it takes place from March the 17th through the 19th of 2017. So tonight is their intent uh, to travel. They're asking for approval to proceed with the planning stages um, to be brought back for a final approval at a later date. And I am recommending that it be approved. Any questions or discussion? Okay, I would seek a motion to approve the intent to travel request for Model UN hosted by Boston College at Copley Square, Boston from March 17th through March 19th, 2017. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Birchman, seconded by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. Yes. It's unanimous. Yes, and unanimous and so carries. Our next item is the middle school club stipend funds. Dr. McLeod. To do <laughs> I've got to read here. So this next one is um, really a request from Mr. Keller to replace the Respect Club that they've had in place um, with the Gay Straight Alliance Club for the 2016-17 school year. It's it's moving the money from one club to another um, to to really just better define how how it's being used and what the club is for. Okay. Any questions or discussion? Okay, great. I will seek a motion to approve the reallocation of $500 in stipend funds from the Respect Club to the Gay Straight Alliance Club at the Hopkinton Middle School. So, okay. Second. <laughs> <laughs> motion by Ms. Kavanaugh, seconded by Ms. Birchman. All those in favor? Yes. Yes. Yes, and it's unanimous and so carries. And our Next item on the agenda is the reallocation of the BCBA funding, Dr. Zaleski. So I'm requesting to reallocate the 1.0 BCBA funds that we had put in the budget um, last year during the budget season. What I've done is um, taken the current BCBAs we had some clients this year and I've allocated them to each building at the elementary levels. And then um, also I had a new hire this year for the Hopkins School who is shared right now with middle school and high school. So my thinking last year was to place a separate BCBA at the secondary level. However, as the year has progressed um, and we have had consultancy services direct from the Department of Education that we hired in the area of transition planning, it was strongly advised to us that we work to enhance this area. Um, she, Dr. Margaret Reed, has informed us that the Department of Education um, is eventually going to be requiring all districts to have this as a mandate. We're trying to stay ahead of the curve. We have so many needs in the district at the secondary level, and the behavioral needs of the students are interchangeable with the transition needs because out in the workforce and in the community, they need this level of support. So in further analysis and looking at it and based on the professional development we've had this year and matching that to the parent needs and the student needs, the parent requests and the student needs, I met with the uh, secondary educators and its secondary administration 
and then brought it to a central office and um, made the determination that it is best utilized to reallocate these funds to support that need. Um, so right now our team chairs, in, in conjunction with our related service providers, are doing their best to transition plan in, in accordance with the law. However, having that transition specialist can connect us to resources and just really analyze and scrutinize the transition planning process and also streamline our assessments, which is really needed. So um, that's the reason for the proposal. With the other half of the uh, position, I'm proposing to put that toward uh, pre-K speech. What we had also done this year, every year annually in special ed, you're required to do a program analysis, and you can choose, there's the director, as to what program you want to analyze. So this year I chose to analyze uh, pre-K. And out of that analysis, among other things, came uh, a recommendation to stabilize the speech pathologist. What was happening is, um, we have varying FTEs within the speech department and different providers were rotating through and that's just not clinically sound. So with the remaining half of that position, in order to get a 1.5 FTE at the pre-K level, I'm looking to put that position at that level. So that's how the 1.0 would be reallocated, which I respectfully request. <laughs> anyone have any questions are these existing people that you're adding capacity to or are they new hires so it would be a new hire for the transition specialist okay. definitely and then for the um, point five speech it's just an increase of service we I had originally recommended a, a cut in speech during the budget season but then as we received referrals so as the year progresses we do our budget you know as you know early right. on right. and as the year progresses and we get referrals coming in from EI our needs increase okay. and that's what I've assessed so as the needs increased in order to make that work this year without coming to folks earlier I was shifting providers down at that level but again, that's not clinically sound because then students have different different people showing up every right. day, and some kids with behavioral needs may struggle or social emotional needs. Right. So, in order to stabilize that, um, that's the reason for the recommendation. Okay. So that's an existing provider, an existing just person. an increase. Okay. Um, uh, really, we're giving the the point the point um, of the position back to that person if it's approved. Okay. Can you just clarify for me what the role of BCBA is, just because? It's not at the tip of my tongue. <laughs> yes, sure. So board certified behavior analysts, what they do is they conduct, um, usually what happens is we get a referral or a request for an assessment. So they'll conduct a functional behavioral assessment and they'll go in and they'll do a series of observations and interviews with faculty as well as with students, maybe even with families. They might do some home assessments. And out of that assessment, it, which is a, um, you know, signed off on assessment by the families during the IEP process usually, they make recommendations. And so then the recommendations usually generates from a BIP, which is a behavior intervention plan. So there'll be varying components of the behavior intervention plan where they'll be doing strategies and interventions, whether it, it could be dis discrete trial. It depends on the disability as to what those interventions would look like. So at the upper levels, it looks a lot different than at the lower levels. The lower levels usually are doing a lot of trialing with students with let's say autism or other disorders. But at the upper levels, it's more intervention and skill strategy based to help them succeed in post-secondary environments. So that's the reason when I looked at the, the need at the secondary post-secondary level with all the training that we had this year with the transition piece, the two are so closely aligned, different roles certainly, but I absolutely feel that the transition specialist would nicely complement the work of the BCBA, which is going to be shared with Hopkins Middle School and High School. Um, I, I don't feel like having a full-time secondary person at that level on top of a transition specialist would be a good use of resources. It just wouldn't because we wouldn't be getting everything that we need. We'd be getting heavy BCBA needs, but that per BCBA is not trained to go out into the field and transition plan. They can, they can certainly support the work, but they wouldn't do that. So that's the reason I feel like if we, if we divide it, it, we're getting the best of both both worlds. Ultimately, we probably will need a 1.0 transition planner as we go along, but we need to start somewhere, and this is the best place to begin because transition planning is not just for high school students. It's age 14 and up. It's middle school and up, but again, high school, we've got to start because the kids are going out into the community, their workforce, maybe job sites, um, college sites and settings. We really have to enhance our work in that area. So our current state of BCBAs if we were to approve this as you've requested, is there is one in Center, one in Elmwood, one in 
Hopkins and the Hopkins BCBA will be shared with the middle school and the high school? Yes. And the caseload is the caseload is very different at the secondary level than the, than the elementary. Every elementary caseloads are very heavy with BCBA needs. They are. Uh, and the PISA students haven't developed their master's skills yet to, to even succeed maybe in the classroom setting. The secondary level, it's spread out. The need is not as intense in terms of um, you know, having somebody stationed that has to be by your side. Because our job is to promote independence as educators. And so although a BCBA is great to have in every building, with the transition planning that needs to take place for these kids to succeed outside of the building, it makes no good sense to have that one person stationed in the building all day awaiting for circumstances to arise. Mm -hmm. That's just not, that's more reactive, it's not proactive. And, um, you know, you may think, well, why didn't we request this in October? Because in October, I had just gotten here, and I had, was just getting the feel of the lay of the land of the district, and it seemed BCBA was so prevalent, and it was. But as I got into the trenches and realized what these cases were about and what the students needed and got to know the parent community, um, and then also received the education from the expert from the state about what's coming down the pike. She has knowledge of the regs beyond what I have knowledge of. It made sense to us to, why wait? Let's be proactive. Parents are requesting it. Kids need it. And we now have the knowledge that this is coming down the pipe. So that's my thinking. Okay. Anybody else have questions? Okay. So I will seek a motion to approve the addition of a 0.5 FTE transition specialist and a 0.5 FTE speech therapist to be funded by the budgeted BCBA position, which will be unfilled. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Bridgman, seconded by Ms. Cavanaugh. All those in favor? Yes. Yes, yes. and it's unanimous and so carries. <coughs> and Dr. Seleski, don't go anywhere because we <laughs> have a point four FTE moderate needs teacher that you want to discuss with us. Yes, so that point four moderate um, request is for the middle school. What we're working to do is to, um, so that the middle school, the way that their schedule is structured is they have a team model. And their team model right now supports students to be able to receive all the special education needs within their um, the content areas. But above and beyond that, we have needs for students have language-based disability needs. And in order for us to um, make the best use of our uh, reading resource that we're going to have this year and to satisfy that need without disrupting the current schedule of the team model, this point four request is needed to complement and service cohort of students that are going to have this level of intervention in need. And in this case, I'll just add on specifically in the science classroom. So um, the way it's been designed to, mo to mirror the level of, of in intervention that the child had been getting in a full day co-taught model, um, they have in place the support for co-teaching in the ELA, support in the social studies, and support in the math. And the one place where they didn't have, and language base truly needs to have that support throughout, and, and maybe, and I was going to say almost additionally, especially important um, in the science classroom where they're dealing with unfamiliar vocabulary, for example, and application. Um, so this person would be specifically only hired for those two periods mm -hmm. to support in, on two, two different teams, because the kids are going to be spread out across two teams, specifically around science. And as Dr. Zaleski said, this will allow us to keep our reading coach whole mm -hmm. um, and not have to, once again, go to that position as a place where we can take part of that role. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that this, the, the model is exciting. It's something that we had been talking about for a couple of years now. Um, and to have this, this population of students identified receiving services at the Hopkins School that's been highly successful and the work that Dr. Zaleski has done with both the principal of Hopkins School and the principal of the middle school to plan for that has been really wonderful. Do we think this is specific to the fifth grade going into sixth grade population? No. Okay. It's specific. It's that age group? It's specific, no, it's specific to the population of students um, whereby the gap had widened over time. And all of the things that you've heard me talking about for the past three years 
have been in order to make sure that 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 we are providing program at the lower elementary level to quickly catch those gaps. Um, there's a, there's a group of students for whom um, the the gap over over time in their period of time between kindergarten and fifth grade, um, despite the instruction that was being provided was continually they were they were falling falling further behind okay. um, and sometimes it's a specific a disability um, as dr zaleski said that results in a language-based need um, which which um, affects students abilities across content areas um, and and sometimes it's a it's a combination of the two things uh, the needs of the student and the um, the instructional program that may not have been available and is now available. But I think my question was, this isn't oh. something that we expect to live at the sixth grade level. It's it's based on your this assessment. This is not and the something we expect to live at the sixth grade level. We expect okay. it to move to with, kind of live with them mm -hmm. and graduate. And when Dr. Zaleski, when you look at students coming up out of Elmwood School or out of the fourth grade, I do believe that we are not looking at a similar number of students needing a similar language based program. Okay. Right. And, and the goal ultimately is to grow this into for the kids to receive services sixth, seventh, then upwards, yeah, right. and to have that reading coach providing the support and intervention along the way, undistracted. Because if you start distracting the reading coach with doing other mm -hmm. things with direct right. intervention, then it, it, it's just not a solid enough intervention. Um, what the, the hope of the program, and already we have started to see some results, is that. We need to see more than a year's growth in a year, significantly. So in order to um, bridge the gap that has grown in terms of a student's, I think, two years plus, um, the expectation is that there be more than a year's growth. And that means a very specialized program with intense instruction happening right. throughout the day. And that's what the program's designed to do. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Okay. Um, at this time, I would seek a motion to approve the addition of a .4 FTE moderate needs teacher to be funded by the operating budget, our pre, um, prepaid SPED mm -hmm. account. Mm -hmm. So, so oh, okay. <laughs> Six. Thank you. Motion by Ms. Birchman, seconded by Ms. Cavanaugh. All those in favor? Yes. Yes. Yes, and it's unanimous and so carries. And I think... Is that all we need? Yes, Dr. and Dr. Before? Zaleski, I'm looking at the time, and you are certainly free to. I know you've had an early morning and probably one again tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank, you, you, very Thank much. you very much. Yeah. Thanks for the information. Thank you. Okay, so we are taking F and E out of order. So next on our agenda will be the FY16 end of year transfers. Mr. Dumas. Sure. First one is the school lunch negative balance transfer. Um, for those of you who are new here, um, the federal and state guidelines uh, that oversee the, uh, the school lunch program um, require that we um, not carry over negative balances in our revolving account. Rather, the school department's operating budget uh, has to absorb it. Um, so. We have 740 students throughout the district who owed a total of $7,259.70. Um, I pointed out that it is higher uh, than it was in FY15. Just to give you some historical uh, background, FY15 was about 5,400, FY14 was about 5,900, FY13 was 4,000. FY12 was 7,000. FY11, the end of my first year here, was $11,500. Oh. So we've had ups and downs, but uh, um, we do um, diligently chase this down, uh, but there's really not a whole lot you can do about it. I have sent letters out to every family um, whose student or students owe a total of $10 or more, uh, and to date, I have not collected very much. Uh, but uh, it'll it'll come in over the summer, but nevertheless, um, we still have to do this journal entry, um, you know, to comply with uh, with the guidelines. So, um, 
Sixty-four percent of this money is owed by um, last year's middle school students. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to point out to you is that we do have a new middle school manager who started on June 1st. So we're hopeful that in future years um, the middle school manager will be a lot more diligent in chasing this money down. In addition, um, we've reached out to uh, Mr. Keller, um, middle school principal, to um, ask what can we do. Everybody points to at the high school, um, all 12th grade students have to pay whatever they owe. Um, otherwise, there are, there are ramifications. Um, it's probably not necessary to go into what those ramifications are. Uh, but Alan Keller is certainly willing to um, incorporate or establish the same type of procedures for eighth graders who are leaving the middle school. Great. So, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, I, in the letters that I send to the parents, I point out to them that uh, they can, for free, uh, access their child's lunch balances on meal, uh, My Payments Plus. They can establish um, levels at which the system will automatically send them an email telling them uh, that their lunch balance has fallen below the pre-designated level that they have uh, established. Uh, you can't, you know, you can lead the huts to the water, but you can't necessarily make them drink it. Can uh, I just add one thing to that, though? As a parent who had a child whose balance went below, like, <laughs> went into the negative and went to try and pay it, the last two weeks of the school year, you couldn't add any money. Yeah, th that and was... And they blocked it until, yeah. like, June 25th. Yeah. So I did go on after the 25th and made the account whole. But, like, it becomes a forgotten thing once the yeah. kids are out of school. So I just wonder why that occurs. That was a bit unusual. That, that's not typical. We were uh, transitioning uh, from... Um, a, we were upgrading our point of sale system and so we had to bring this the entire system down in order to get that uh, transition uh, taken care of so that doesn't happen every year so uh, with all that in mind I'm happy to answer any questions but um, the um, journal entry of the expense transfer that we're requesting uh, is to transfer expense from the school lunch revolving account to the operating budget. We have a school food service account in the operating budget. Um, and so um, we make that recommendation to you. And any other questions? I do have a question. So we're, but we're charging, we're transferring a $50,000. That's later, that's totally different. This is, this is a legally required budget transfer, which is why it's uh, being requested separately. Okay, okay, okay. I'm looking, at, I'm looking ahead at my next memo. I'm sorry. Okay. Got it. So as you recoup from parents, mm -hmm. it just goes back into the operating budget? No, it goes back into the revolving account. So theoretically, over time, we would be collecting twice. The budget would be making us whole. But we don't zero out everybody's balances because that wouldn't be fair to the people who make their payments. Oh, no. No, I just wanted to know where the yeah. money then goes if yeah. Lori shores up her account. Yeah, it goes back into the child's It was $2.75. <laughs> and, <it, laughs> and it gets credited to, um, to the revolving, revolving account. account. And just for your information, we start uh, making phone calls when a student gets 10 meals in the red. Um, so you would never have received a phone call for one meal. Or I know, because I also have a student <laughs> who comes home panicked yeah. and is like, what? but I get the alerts. Yeah. I, I know what you're talking about, but I know that there are some parents very averse to the system because they don't want to pay the fee to yeah. have the automated payment. I, I mean, personally, I find yeah. it convenient. But the thing is, I, I appreciate you stating that because I don't think parents all understand how that process works. But Yeah, they can get information for free. You don't have to pay anything to get notifications. Yeah. Uh, you have to pay a fee if you want to make a payment online. Right. My understanding is, and this is, would maybe help some people but not others of the $7,000, is that you cannot transfer money between children in your family? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, you can do that. 
Okay. All you have to do is request it, and, and the way a lot of people do that. Uh, in particular, they do it if a student is um, graduating and they have another sibling. Uh, they'll send us an email asking us to move Johnny's balance to uh, Joey's account. You just can't do it automated. Okay, that's like you, you just can't. Do, I can't you go into the system no. and do it, right. but I can no. email somebody. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. It would be nice to have a family plan, though, don't you think? It, it would be convenient. Right. Um, just drawing yeah. from one account with anybody that has this this last name. <laughs> yeah, yes. Except that you wouldn't be able to track which one's buying more <laughs> well, junk than the no, other. No, no. <laughs> so they still have to put their pin in yes, on that's the keypad. Yeah, that's so right. They have that's to right. Track their own. Any other questions? I outed myself, so I'm yes, fine with you it. Did. But That's good. I'm up to yeah. date, so I'm not worried anymore. <laughs> um, okay. So if somebody could make a motion, it would be great. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, I seeking a motion to transfer two dollars and seventy-five cents. No, no this <laughs> um, a motion to transfer seven thousand two hundred and fifty-nine dollars and seventy cents from the school lunch revolving account to the operating budget account. Number nine zero two one three four zero four dash five three zero seven one zero. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Kavanaugh, seconded by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 It's unanimous and so okay. And then we go on to my favorite part of my favorite meeting. <laughs> so uh, first of all, I want to thank the school committee for understanding why we couldn't get this recommendation to you earlier. Uh, it's just a matter of timing, closing the books, the schedule that we have, uh, and that sort of thing. So we had to wait for the final payroll, uh, which, even though it's being paid tomorrow, included nine out of the ten days for a salary, uh, for hourly people, was part of last year's FY16's uh, budget because only one day in the pay period was uh, July. It was uh, July 1st. Mm -hmm. So um, we had to wait to get that payroll processed, and now that it is, we know what our final numbers are. So um, at this point, um, the now that you have approved the school lunch negative balance transfer, uh, at this point, the operating budget has a, a positive balance of $270,680.32. I'm sure you've read the email. There are a couple of options. Um, we can't make any additional prepayments. Um, however, you can make some accounting adjustments, some of which have been typically made in, in past years. Uh, it's within your authority to direct the administration to charge expenses that were previously charged against re revolving accounts to the FY16 operating budget to absorb all or a portion of the balance. Uh, as Kathy and I discussed, if you wish to use this balance to give us the district maximum flexibility going forward, we're recommending that um, the following adjustments, which will accomplish this, be approved. So um, I don't know whether you want to vote on them um, separately or, or as a package, but I'm happy to go through them individually. Um, I will let everyone speak to this. Uh, my personal opinion is they should be voted separately. Um, just because I have concerns over the of the the athletic one specifically is my biggest concern, but I want everyone to have the opportunity to say it. I mean, if you prefer them to be got done together, we can vote on the method first, or however you want to go about it. I'm happy to go separate. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I'm happy to go separate, or maybe if you want to just discuss that one first, if if your questions are answered, then. Um, we can discuss it first. Or if, if we want. change it, maybe either way we should go first because if we change it, then that might impact the other ones. Before you do any of that, could I make a, a sure. statement? Um, I did want to add to Ralph's comments that we did look at this, he and I together, um, extensively, clearly. Um, and many of the savings that have been realized were due to unexpected payroll changes. So I can call out. Bob, for example, who we talked about not replacing, and that was an intentional um, strategic decision based on the fact that what it would have cost to hire an interim assistant superintendent, I did not believe would be value added 
to the work within the district. Um, there were other situations, as you're aware, um, that have happened that were not expected through the year, um, throughout the year, that in the end we realized, as Ralph, Ralph and I were, were speaking at length over the, during this week, um, when you look at expenses and the overall expense account um, balance is we're actually at a negative six hundred dollars out of a six million dollar budget that's how closely <laughs> it was budgeted when it comes to payroll this is a happy surprise and so we're at a point where when we've done the transfers that we can done prepaying special education um, that we have an opportunity to through our policies um, that that have been adopted and uh, to make some payments that will put us in a place when there are unexpected expenses next year and I'm sitting here at this table saying to you well this is what happened and we didn't expect it or there this broke or we have this move in um, we'll have a funding source that we otherwise would have had to make transfers to allow for um, and so the example that you see under athletic revolving although I know seems confusing because it's counter to the uh, presentation that we made to you about the um, that pilot team what are we calling them the ski team ski no, right right but the they're called a pilot program right it's a pilot ski team um, it was an example that I kind of mentioned in passing but when we see it in writing we realize that the fact was that that was supposed to be self-funding so that in itself is probably not the best example um, but there are other things that come along that could be used um, for that purpose. So I don't want the uh, it, it there to be misunderstanding around that particular example. Um, that that if we had this additional expense, that's what we would charge to it because we do know that they're going to be collecting fees that will sustain the pilot, as we had discussed here at, at school committee. Um, but I think before you take that this on, having an over arching understanding of why it is that we have this opportunity is an important to to note. Yeah, the, the bottom line is I jumped the gun on the ski team. We had a brief conversation. It made it to the memo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, so. What we left out was if the school committee sh uh, should should desire. Yeah. So, so I think it's a great wish. conversation to take them up separately. I just wanted before you got there to have a, an overview, and then I also wanted for the sake of the school committee to know that Mr. Graziano and I had an extensive conversation and uh, a phone conference um, with Mr. Dumas today as well um, because I wanted his concerns to be uh, also voiced around this particular item. I was going to say, this is one of his favorite meetings. I it think. is. That's why we yeah, had a spreadsheet. <laughs> oh, we did? <laughs> he, he's on a plane right now. Yeah. Funny. He is on a plane, but I, he, I did ask him if it would be okay if I shared that we did have a conversation and he, he was comfortable with, um, with after our conversation. So. So um, okay, so why don't we just take them in order, sure. and and we will vote on them separately. Okay. Right. Of course, now I'm causing myself to have to be really good with motions right off the bat. But, <laughs> I'll see if um, I can help you. Uh, <laughs> sure. Um, so let's talk about the circuit breaker revolving sure. transfer first, and and I really appreciate your accounting you know for dummies discussion at this point since this is always my least favorite meeting of the year so, <laughs> so um, at this point in time the circuit breaker revolving account has um, a balance that is eighty two thousand three hundred and sixty four dollars and seventy cents lower than it legally can be Desi makes you use the money that you collect in year one has to be spent by the end of year two so this year, we took in $560,698. So that is the maximum the balance can be. So what's going to happen there is we're going to take money that's already been charged to the circuit breaker expense, and instead, we're going to charge it against the budget so that the circuit breaker account will be equal to the maximum that it can be in the budget, uh, the the balance remaining in the budget will go from the 270,000 that it currently is to 270 minus 82. Okay? okay. So, uh, I recommend that we um, charge the sped tuitions private account, which means private schools, 
and we credit the circuit breaker revolving account for $82,364.70. And I second that recommendation, Mr. Mm -hmm. Davis. Thank you. Any questions on the circuit breaker revolving account charge and credit? Can I just say one thing that maybe this is just gratuitous or maybe it will help you understand, but I've had to do this on the town side as well with some accounts um, that I've been working with. It, it, so first of all, this is what the town does as well. They'll charge, they can re reallocate what they charge against what, um, although they have less flexibility than we do to transfer money. So I know sometimes there are concerns in the public about moving money around. So it, this isn't anything that the town isn't doing that every town doesn't do. But what I have come to understand and in as simple a way as I can put it is you either move it or you lose it, mm -hmm. right? So if it's left in the operating budget, then it's gone. So this is a way for us legally to still use, get use out of that money that's been appropriated for us, for the students. So that's sort of what I've, that's after a, a long time, <laughs> boiled it down to yeah. for myself, just for whatever. Yep, thank you. Lingering concerns that's there helpful. might be. Any questions? Okay. So this is where it's fun. Mm -hmm. I will seek a motion to charge the SPED tuition's private account $82,364.70 and credit the Circuit Breaker Revolving account $82,364.70. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Birchman, seconded by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And it's unanimous and so carries. Okay, the next one is athletic revolving. Um, we're proposing that we uh, charge the athletic coach's salary account and credit the athletic revolving account for $4,200. It'll provide funding in the revolving account uh, for whatever needs um, the, the system needs um, in FY17 that's not currently uh, covered. And it will still comply with the maximum balance guidelines established in the policy. For your information, the, the policy says that the money that you take in in one year, at the end of the year, the balance cannot be any higher than the money you took in uh, in, the, in the previous year. For example, Mr. Dumas, would this be somewhere that if we had expenses around a potential turf field committee, um, some feasibility or anything sure. like that could come out of? Mm -hmm. So that's an example that jumps to mind that we haven't budgeted for. Um, but it definitely will not be used to fund the pilot ski team. <laughs> yeah. Just let me call that out. You won't hear that in the motion. I, I think that that's an example, though, when we were looking um, just from our initial discussions when they came that one time about the um, the turf field, um, that, that those kinds of expenses could be charged to athletic revolving. I don't want to take a question time away from anyone else first, because I do have a question. So anyone else have any? Okay. So ski team aside, which makes me much more comfortable. Um, what? Just remind me, <laughs> is it the tickets that we charge for games? That like, what funds this? Like, oh, wh oh. how do we figure out what our funding was this year? To M most of the money um, is from the uh, athletic user fees that the students pay. Okay. Uh, it also includes you know gate receipts, but most of the money is is uh, uh, fees. Okay, so. So this brings it to the max. Okay, the maximum balance. Yeah, we're way below the maximum. Uh, we took in one hundred eighty-three thousand dollars this year. The balance right now is only forty-eight thousand. So we're adding four thousand to it. So. It's, okay. Yeah, we're not even close to the max. Gotcha. Okay. Anybody else have questions? Okay, so I will. See Seek a motion to charge the athletic coach's salary account $4,200 and credit the athletic revolving account $4,200. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Birchman, seconded by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And it's unanimous and so carries. The next one is preschool tuition revolving. Um, this adjustment will bring the revolving account right up to the maximum um, guidelines. Um, that is an amount equal to the revenue received in FY16, which was 152765 
Right now, the balance in the account is 71465 So this adjustment would bring us, like I said, right up to the total. Um, and I, I pointed out equally as important uh, as that, if not more important, is it will provide funding to cover any anticipated preschool student needs, most of which are special ed. And we just learned of one tonight. I was going to say, this is not covering the 0.5 FTE, though. That's from no. the BCBA. Correct. Okay. Right. But it would be more of that type of Yeah, this, this was the year just today. Yeah, um, what will happen is once everybody lands and we know what we need and who they are and how much they're going to get paid, we'll come back to you with budget transfer requests to move the money around. So um, we recommend that we charge the SPED pre-K paraprofessional salary account and credit the preschool tuition revolving account for 81300 Anyone have questions? Except me, who always has a question. Okay. But so, preschool isn't all SPED students. Correct. The people who pay are the non-SPED students. Right. So. And we already use that money to fund a lot of the paras who are in the system. Okay, I just am trying to figure out, I mean, this isn't this isn't the same as having the DESE regulations on our circuit breaker. This is our own committee regulations on yep. how to use this account. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we have restrictions on, like when you say if a need arises, a preschool student need arises, does that just mean a SPED student or does that mean any preschool student? Well, I don't And think, I don't recall. I don't, we wouldn't be, uh, we don't expend district funds for non-SPED preschool students. However, we could, we could, we can broaden that definition by saying that the teachers teach all kids right. Right. and the paraprofessionals support all kids. Um, so just today, Lauren Dubow brought to Karen's attention that given the additional numbers of students, special education students that are moving into the district, and given the fact that we do need to maintain a ratio, which ends up opening up again for additional students to be able to participate in the program you could say that it benefits all students because they're all being taught by highly qualified teachers I just am trying to I just was trying to make sure if there was if we're transferring it from a mm -hmm. sped para salary account mm -hmm. does it have restrictions on what that money you know, so that's what I was trying to figure out if we hire this teacher that we just found out about if that's approved um, it would benefit all kids. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry if I made it more convoluted. No, no, I okay. was just trying to gather if we had restrictions on, yeah. like, no. do we have to parse out that money from the other money and what we can use it for? Mm, and it no. doesn't sound like that. No. So that's what I was trying to figure out. Okay. If, if I didn't create more questions by my question, then I will seek a motion to charge the SPED pre-k preschool para salary account eighty one thousand three hundred dollars and credit the preschool tuition revolving account eighty one thousand three hundred dollars so moved second a motion by ms birchman seconded by ms knight all those in favor yes yes yes, yes. and it's unanimous and so carries okay the next one is school lunch now i know you recall that there was a, a recommendation to increase lunches the lunch fee by 25 cents across the board, which would raise um, an additional $45,000 in revenue. Without a lunch increase, we project that the program will run a deficit next year of $23,000. With a 25 per, uh, cent increase, if we can generate 45,000 bucks, we'd have a surplus in the operation next year for $22,000. Now, we're going to have to do one thing or the other. Either we're going to have to raise the lunch fee by something to cover the $22,000, or rather than charging um, the parents in, in the system what amounts to an additional $45,000 um, if you're going to raise the uh, lunch fee by 25 cents, you can um, avoid that totally by charging some of the expense that we incurred this year, FY16, for, for example, uh, 
um, labor costs. Instead of charging the revolving account, we would charge the budget. So that would create a scenario by which you would have a buffer of $50,000 going into next year. So you could avoid the salary increase, uh, you could avoid um, the price increase, and you'd have a, a buffer there uh, in the event that uh, we needed some equipment. You know, we had talked about that a, a few meetings back about how um, the revolving account really cannot absorb any um, any costs associated with with equipment. It just can't under under the current um, the current setup. We've had you know increases in um, in uh, labor costs um, and that sort of thing. So um, we're trying to kill two birds with one stone here. We're trying to shore up the account for the future and we're trying to avoid the price increase. We may need a price increase a year from now, but uh, but it probably wouldn't be because the program uh, didn't have, couldn't absorb, the, the revolving account couldn't absorb a loss two years in a row. It would be because the federal government is requiring us to raise prices on the basis of what's called the Price Equity um, Act, which I, I wrote about in that request uh, for an increase. We don't have a need for an increase right now from a legal perspective. We do have a need for an increase from an operational perspective. Um, this allows us to avoid that. Are there any anticipated increases that would go along with some of the healthy um, lunch initiatives that are going on? Would that help? Uh, well, one of the problems that we have is that the healthy initiatives uh, have not been um, received well by the clients. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's the polite way of putting it. In the past, we used to be able to sell snacks that were much more enticing to students. Okay, ice cream, for example. Uh, I don't know that we ever could sell soda. But those types of things were money makers, which offset, you know, um, the costs of doing business. Now that we can't do that. Was that the year we had the 11,000 balance that was unpaid? That, that, <laughs> that, that, that was 11,000. Those were the good times. The parents didn't want to yeah. pay the balance yeah. because yeah. they didn't want their kids eating the ice cream. But, but those were the good times. Uh, now, if you're, if you're alluding to um, some of the behind the scenes requests about non-GMO food and um, organic lunch yes um, what uh, organic organic thank you uh, that's really it's got to be part of, a, of an, an industry-wide initiative uh, in, in our case I would say it's a Whitson's initiative it can't be a Hopkinton initiative because the the uh, availability of um, in particular organic foods uh, throughout the school year is not very good. It works real well in, in a place like California. Um, we did some research, uh, I think I shared it with the committee you several did. months ago. Uh, I reached out to uh, a, um, a town uh, near San Francisco that does operate all organic and their meal prices are like $6.50 and they have access to organic uh, food all year round. And, and so, it, you know, we're, we're certainly bringing, you know, stuff in uh, bit by bit. For example, yogurt is, is um, organic now, and there are a few other things. Non-GMO is a little bit di uh, different because you really don't know uh, at this point in Massachusetts whether, you know, there's no labeling requirement um, to say whether something's got GMOs or doesn't have GMOs. Naturally, the people that are selling non-GMO are going to say it, and the people who are using regular food don't want to say these have GMOs in it. You know, I, I understand that uh, Vermont is undertaking something that will have all everything labeled uh, GMO, non-GMO non very, very soon. Uh, but th this $50,000 would um, not really cut into um, that particular um, piece of business within school lunch. I think we'll be organic when we're all not here anymore. <laughs> so, it's a tough one to sell. 
You just mean retired. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was thinking I maybe it would be because over. we don't no. have the organic Res- lunch. Respectfully to the, whether it's 100 or 200 families that are interested in it, we provide uh, school lunch for 2,500 kids a day. And so yeah. it might be fair for, you know, or it might be okay for one family to say, yeah, I'd pay six bucks. But uh, you'd have to offer that six dollar meal. You're for going free. off the agenda there, Mr. Yeah. Dumas. <laughs> you know, the, I so who else has? I'm questions? getting all my opportunities <laughs> yes, here. Yes, you are. To, to, uh, You're to almost as pessimist, uh, pessimistic as lawyers are. So uh, yeah, um, I'm so. an accountant. That's how we. Are. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jean, did you have any questions? I, just, I, I would just say that um, I guess I, I I prefer this approach this time because. Even though you know we're on television, mm-hmm. school's out. I hate to raise the price of lunch, essentially in the summer, without people yeah. really being aware of it happening. And I know we talked about it yeah. when they came, but that was a few months ago. And um, and especially because that's looming, but not not here at the moment. I think this is uh, if if we have the opportunity to do it this way this year, I think that's probably more fair. I don't know if I didn't pick up on it, but I didn't realize that it was not all to offset the 25 cents. I didn't know that it was, I know we talked about, was it a refrigerator that had mm-hmm. gone out mm-hmm. this year? We could center. So I, I do like it for that. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I'm glad we were able to do this. Yes. So my question is, the school food service account has a surplus? No, food service account uh, at the end of this year will be as close to zero as it possibly can be. I'm talking about the revolving account. Right, but we're charging the school food service account 50000 right. to credit right. the lunch revolving account. So I'm trying to figure out why one has 50 Well, it doesn't have 50 However, um, the bottom line of the school budget can absorb it. What we'll do is we're going to run the, the budget line item for school food service in the negative. By your approving this, you're effectively approving that it go into the negative. Overall, however, the bo- the school budget is going to absorb it. It's going to absorb it. It's not going to. School budget can't be zero. Some of the line items within the school budget can be, but they're offset by positives in in other areas. Oh. And this is one that can be, obviously. They all can be. Oh, okay. Yeah with your approval but that's this is the only one that we're doing that to uh the next one will as well i guess i just don't understand that like doesn't that (laughs) make it look completely fiscally irresponsible to run something into the negative i mean i i I don't i think the the way gene explained it really helped me it's moving it around it it's within allowable to allowable places. So um, the fact that this ends up being absorbed by the budget and, and creating more flexibility within it because we were able to move a 50000 from here to there, which then allowed us to charge it in another place. So I like your, your description of moving money around within the boundaries of what is allowable. Um, and so although it's not crystal clear to me either, Lori, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I, it makes sense on the level of being able to put a, a bucket of money somewhere to then move to another bucket. The school committee has what's called fiscal autonomy over its budget. The, the only requirement is that you not spend more overall than what was appropriated. So you can overexpend line item one as long as you can make it up in line item two Um, there's no requirement for every line item within the school department budget to come in at zero okay as long as the positives and negatives balance out um you're you've met your requirement so I, i i get the whole use it or lose it idea the only other question i have which i forgot to ask before was even though we're not on this item, but it's related, why do we think we're going to operate at a deficit next year? What is the reasoning behind that? Well, the reasoning behind it is that um, 
increase labor costs, increase operating costs more than anything. So labor costs being the cafeteria worker contract that we just signed? That's correct. And but how much of that is responsible for the deficit? Do we know, like percentage-wise? or? I don't have all that information with me. Long okay, long. and so when you say operating expenses, what does that entail? Well, it includes the cost of paying Whitsons mm -hmm. to operate. It, inc it includes food. Uh, it includes um, some equipment that um, Whitson's puts in place for us that gets spread out over the, the cost of which gets spread out over the, uh, the three years of the contract. But isn't that fixed? Uh, well, no, it's not. Um, the, well, food, food costs obviously are not fixed. No, I get that, but like what they charge us for the service it, and it, the equipment isn't fixed in the contract? The equipment is fixed but we had a $30,000 investment in equipment and in year one we didn't use any of the, um, the investment. The investment in year one came on in June which was that point of sale system that I mentioned earlier. So that, what that means is that the entire $30,000 instead of be spread, uh, being spread over $10,000 each year, it's going to be spread over two years so next year we'll take a fifteen thousand um, dollar. We'll get a fifteen thousand dollar charge uh, for equipment. In the following year we'll get fifteen. Whereas in year one, which was this year, we got a zero um, charge for it. Uh, Whitson's charges us on on, a, on the, a management fee and an administrative fee uh, that's based upon um, how many meal equivalents get sold. We're really kind of in the weeds here, but yeah, uh, that's that's how it, it's a variable uh, cost. It's not a fixed cost. The more meals we we uh, sell, the more we pay Whitson's. Gotcha. Okay. Any other questions? So I just, the way I'm understanding what you're saying is the emphasis on this particular motion is the credit as opposed to the charge, right? You you need the additional money in that revolving account, right. and so you're able to run a negative balance in that. For the year, for next year. So rather than seven cents from this line, $27 from that line, whatever, you can run the negative 50. Overall, it comes out to zero, mm -hmm. but whereas in some other of the motions, part of the motivation is to get a balance down to zero. This is to increase a revolving balance is really the focus of what you're trying to That's do. That's what this, the focus is way. here. Okay. Yep. Yep. Or the motivation, I guess. All right. Thank you. not an accountant for a reason um okay any other questions all right i will seek a motion to charge the school for food service account fifty thousand dollars and credit the school lunch revolving account fifty thousand dollars so moved second oh, go ahead. <laughs> motion by ms birchman seconded by ms knight <coughs> all those in favor yes yes, yes. And I'm still going to vote no. So, um, but at majority. Thank you. So, so the last one is the building use revolving. Uh, that leaves us with $52,000, uh, well, almost $53,000 remaining out of the FY16 school budget. And the only revolving account that we could uh, possibly make any adjustments to without um, violating the uh, school committee policy on revolving account balances is the building use account. Building use account took in um, $107,000 this year. The current balance in that account is 30. So if we were to um, charge $52,815.62 that's been ch already charged to the building use, if we credit building use and charge the budget, for Billings and Grounds contracted services, um, 
we would uh, utilize the balance in the budget and we would uh, still be within the guidelines of the maximum balances and this would put us in a position to provide funding for any unexpected repairs uh, that we need next year without coming back to the school committee for a budget transfer or without going back to the town for additional funding. Will we still be made aware of what those repairs are or because we don't have to come for a transfer we won't know what's being repaired? I would think anything major uh, we would come to you with. I mean currently the uh, billing use revolving account absorbs a lot of what, what's in the budget. I don't have my budget book with me but if you were to go to the buildings and grounds area you would see all, all of the offsets. Um, I think we probably use seventy five or eighty thousand um, dollars of buildings and grounds uh, of building use money every year to help us fund the budget. If this would also be reported though in your quarterly financial updates. Yeah, it would. So yeah. when you have those reports th from from Ralph, these kinds of expenses would be outlined um, called out to you. Okay, so going back to Jean's logic, <laughs> uh -oh. if we don't, so I just don't know if it's the same use it or lose it, or if it's yeah, a it this is saving us from having to come do the transfers. No. So it's, this it, is a use it or lose this it. This is a use situation. it or lose it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Not just a to keep from having to do no, budget no, transfers no, 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 no. at right. meetings. Right. No. But I think to a your point question. though, any major expense is you know, there's the threshold about whether you do or don't have yep. to get a bid or anything like that. Right. So anything that is really significant does have to come to we're us. Gonna let you True. Know. Above that. Absolutely. But, but I mean we don't if this thing. is like extra light bulbs, yes. I don't think we're right. gonna be discussing that. But right. okay. I hope we're not. <laughs> <laughs> I might be absent at that meeting. Mm -hmm. So yes, if we were to expend more than we planned for in, in out of the revolving account, we'd have to come to you. Right. To okay. to comply with the policy. So similar to the food services, the contracted services account is negative or zero at this point. Right. And we're putting it in the negative again. That's correct. Um my I, I mean I I am fully the use it or lose it person, especially like if you have a flex spending account, you're gonna lose it if you don't use it. But it's my money that I'm doing that with and that I guess my struggle is is that if we if we didn't do this it would go back to the town mm -hmm. right you know m maybe you know next year we'll, we'll take it a, another step and say and come to you with a budget transfer at the same time that we're requesting the expense transfer uh, because that would ensure that the account didn't run in the negative but th the real question is to what end Laurie if we've been fiscally responsible and we've been able to manage our budget in a way that realizes us at the end of the year with this kind of savings, that I believe that the monies that were appropriated for the school department to manage have been managed extremely well. Um, and so this is a nice opportunity to put the school department in a position of some, um, some comfort, I suppose, should the unexpected occur. And I don't like I don't disagree with the rationale. I just mm -hmm. feel like it's it feels frustrating to feel like we have to not apply it somewhere. I, I don't I don't pretend that I completely um, understand the positives and the negatives, except that you know I, I certainly depend on Ralph to be able to um, to to direct us in that way. No, and I appreciate it. and I'm not at all second guessing mm -hmm. your thought process at all on where we need an insurance per se mm -hmm. and because we see it all the time. I just feel like it's a really difficult area to explain to the general public and if they were to ask questions about it, it's not because it's not there's nothing untoward happening with the money. I get right. it. And that, and I'm, there's no one there's no hint at that and I don't want to even give that thought process from even, you know, voting and what, ha what have you. But the problem is, is that, it, you know, it's like it, people have different values on do you need the insurance, do you not need the insurance. And it's, I just feel like it's a very difficult decision to make on behalf of an entire community. I personally think the insurance idea is a good one. Mm -hmm. um, and that we, especially in building use, I feel like we, 
we have buildings that are deteriorating and then you know and we've had problems that were unexpected and god knows if we have a winter like we did two years ago we may have more so i just i get it it's just more of like whether or not do i feel like i could stand up on town meeting floor and explain that i don't know and that's that's my that's my discomfort and i'm just voicing my personal discomfort with it um but not because I feel like anything wrong is happening with the money. No, you know, I, I don't know how to uh, assuage your feelings other than to perhaps show you at the end of the day how it all works out, you know. Um, oh, no, I mean, yeah. I feel like the, the spreadsheet would <clears throat> yeah. be just as Greek to me as any of it anyway. But, I mean, I but I, it's more of the fact that I'm making a making a judgment call on behalf of an entire community and I don't know that they would all make the same judgment although I feel much closer to the problems than the rest of the community is so I guess that's where I'm supposed to take my comfort from but that that's my personal hang-up right now and that's that's what I'm so might I offer um, I understand the dilemma Lori I do um, might I offer that the school committee is working under the advisement of the people that you hire and Mr. Dennis is one of them and so I, f I feel that it, it, you have said to me before each of you you don't always fully understand the recommendation if it comes to you said you're not an accountant you're not educators you depend on the people that work for you to provide you with the best advice and um, I certainly depend on Ralph in, in that regard um, and yet I understand what you're saying in terms of, I mean, I was at town meeting when that question was asked of the superintendent um, several years ago, right. what, what are you going to do with the money? And I think having a plan to be able to respond, which in that case there was not uh, a response. Um, I feel like these are very well thought out responses. and. Believe me, it would not be you or I answering the question. It would be Ralph. No, but <laughs> the responsibility still lies with us. That's it does. And it I does, take that personally. But the responsibility is to to hire the people that will then advise you. And I guess okay. if there's concern about that, then that's a different conversation. Okay, um, I'm, I'm not. I don't think to... anybody suggests. No, no, no. That I mean, I know. Yeah. I'm not suggesting that no, no. that's being suggested. But I am wanting to kind of take away a little bit of the um, that that level of responsibility in terms of being able to um, fully explain it to somebody that asks the question. Well, um, and can I share with you sort of what the thought process I've developed over the years that, yeah. that I've sat here, and it may um, make you feel better, may make you feel worse, I don't know. We'll find out at the end. But, um, <laughs> you know, first of all, the amount of money that we're talking about is less than half of 1% of our of our overall budget and any budget is a guess right and so we've discussed many times lamented many times about how early we do our budget here and how much particularly in the area of special education but certainly not exclusively in that area changes from the time that we start talking about our budget from the time that we vote our budget from the time that the town votes our budget until the time that we're actually really implementing the bulk of our budget which is when our students arrive in September and so a lot of things change and I think you're right Kathy that um, that what this amount of money represents is is not the use it or lose it philosophy being employed during the year but very much the taking a hard look at every penny and saving where they can and we do transfers and whatnot and so in I, I this to me shows a very responsible implementation of the budget but I also believe that that money was voted by the town to be spent on education and so what we're doing is using the balance of it all in not just allowable but recommended practices i mean this is done in every district to support the educational expense of you know this year and the next year um wherever that that's possible and i think you know what i've also learned over the years of of sitting at um town meeting and particularly was it last year with the five million dollar free cash <laughs> that had built up over time e even if if you don't have that experience 
if if we let's say we take we say okay we're not going to spend this fifty thousand dollars that's going to go to free back to the town it goes into free cash but that doesn't get certified for an entire year so essentially that money doesn't support anything for a year if you're counting on those exact dollars whereas if it stays as as allowed in our world it supports you know if the you know if we could have paid for the uh, um, what's it scoreboard or a furnace breaks or the refrigerator breaks or whatever um, so that's sort of the understanding that I've come to over the years and it took me a long time because I think this is very complex municipal finance and the town has sort of different rules than than the school department does we do have more flexibility under the law than the municipality does and it's taken me a really, really long time, and I don't pretend to understand all of it, but that's sort of where I've come to, and I don't know if that helps you or not, but that's sort of why I, I'm more comfortable with essentially what our accounting adjustments at the end of the year so that I think we're making responsible use of what's what has responsibly been accumulated, I, I guess, over the course of the year in savings of personnel and in savings of expenses and and whatnot so that was a really long <laughs> no, ended way of saying that that's sort of where I arrived at I appreciate it thank you and I, I want to just reiterate I'm not questioning your judgment on these or your recommendation it's just the the inherent responsibility that's a little daunting there, there um, but was, a, I, time, there but was I, a time that might might have bothered me but it doesn't anymore <laughs> but <laughs> I want to make it clear that that's not my intimation so, and it was yeah. not my intended outcome of this the statement well um, and, and, and I think yeah. that th I truly believe that you can come back to another meeting this year and something will happen and be like see Lori we <laughs> needed <laughs> that fifty two thousand dollars and you can write it in a memo too okay. if you want um, <laughs> So, if no one else has questions, and I've already agonized long enough over this issue. Just the final thing that I forgot to say is we do get audited twice every year, right, through the town process. And so it's not like other eyes, independent, neutral eyes aren't on this as well. Oh, so no, no, yeah. That gives me a lot of comfort, honestly, because I don't balance my own checkbook. So um, I'm glad that the town is doing that for us. But. I don't either. Doesn't the bank do that for you? Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. We have no way of knowing. Electronically, you don't have to balance your check. <laughs> so that was my final. Okay. Thought. Great. Anybody else? All right. So I will seek a motion to charge the Buildings and Grounds Contracted Services Account $52,815.62 and credit the Building Use Revolving Account $52,815.62. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Birchman, seconded by Ms. Cavanaugh. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And it's unanimous and so carries. Yeah. Okay. Ralph, okay. are we well, done abusing you today? We have one more. <laughs> oh, man. Warrant. We have the, th have the third $50,000 motion in a row. Oh, wait. One second. Thank Sorry, you. Mr. Dumas. Um, based on our vote on the, um, oh, I just lost my sheet, sorry, transfers. on the um, end of year transfers, especially regarding the school lunch revolving accounts, um, do we no longer have to take up item E, the school lunch price that's increase? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Great. That. So that's going to be removed. And that will be removed. There you go. And we can move on now to letter G, which is the Capital Project Article Warrant 16-080 in the amount of $50,652.50. Mr. Dumas. We have one, uh, we have two invoices from Gale Associates uh, related to the Hopkinson High School roof project uh, as appropriated in Article 27 of the May 2015 Annual Town Meeting. Invoice number 160 for 45,512.50. Invoice number 160 for 5,140. And uh, the superintendent and I recommend that these items be approved for payment by the school committee. Any questions? All right. So I would seek a motion to approve the payment of warrant number 
zero six nine in wait that doesn't match what's the number of the warrant mr dumas I don't, uh, gene. um this one capital projects yeah, for $50,652.50. 16-080. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, all right. So I'll start again. Move, uh, seek a motion to approve the payment of warrant six number 16-080 in the amount of $50,652.50 50, mm -hmm. to the vendors outlined in the warrant. So move. Second. Motion by Ms. Birchman, seconded by Ms. Kavanaugh. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And it's unanimous and so carries. And I think now, Mr. Dumas, maybe? No, I'll stick around. Yeah. You're going to stick around? Yeah, might as well. Items by consensus are interesting <laughs> to you, too. Um, so we can move on to old business. And the next item on our agenda is the revised calendar for 2016-2017. Dr. McLeod. It was actually quite interesting because as you were reviewing the calendar, um, I had a question from Lori saying, it seems odd that there's a, there's a professional development day right in the middle of the last week of school. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, it, it completely, I completely missed it. Um, what this calendar shows you is the addition of preschool release time that had currently not been provided. And working with Mrs. DeBowen with the preschool um, teachers, we identified times when, um, particularly the, after, the morning, sorry, the afternoon preschool, um, there, there would be some release times. And you can see that they're called out in purple. But when purple was added to green, it made red, and it looked like it looked like uh, it all school professional development day. So I just asked Janine to just leave that off, and then we, they could figure it out by looking at the calendar. It also changes the early release day um, in May to reflect to accurately um, reflect prom. Um, originally, it was it was on the 19th, and so we moved that to the 12th. So those two revisions are the only things that are have been changed to the calendar. Um, we, although we have shared it publicly, what people were really interested in was the first day of school and the last day of school. Yeah. Um, so we will share this um, and let p and call out what the changes are. But the changes really don't affect people in any way other than that last early release day. Um, nothing else of, of substance has been changed in the calendar. Can she just do it like she did the 16th of June and make two colors in there? That's what it looks 16th like 16th of June. Um, see how she has like the two colors in there? It might be a way to do it and have both of them. Ooh. This has it online. Has the yeah, but when you square. print it, it looks, oh, looks like yeah. Printed, well, the whole box red. looked red when I printed it, and so I was like, what's going on? We you have know, a day off of Lori, I think it's fine because if you look under June the 14th, yeah. it's right. green, meaning it's an additional key date, okay. and it shows that it's the last day for preschool, so I think it's fine. Okay, great. So, Anyone have any questions, concerns? No. 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 We were just admiring it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I will seek a motion to approve the revised 2016-2017 school calendar as provided in the agenda materials. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Kavanaugh, seconded by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. Yes, yes. and it's unanimous as it carries. And our second item of old business is the high school state side final approval Dr. McLeod for the uh, varsity field hockey trip team it, it has already been approved by you for the intent nothing has changed um, from the original um, they went on this trip last year and so um, you have a recommended motion before you All right I will seek a motion to approve the final approval request for the varsity field hockey team to travel to Dennis Yarmouth High School from September 9th through September 10th 2016 so moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Birchman, seconded by Ms. Kavanaugh. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And it's unanimous and so carries. And we now are at our second opportunity for public comment and we still have no public to comment so we can move on to items by consensus but prior to you you know you might want to take a sip of water I know um, but mm -hmm. I wanted to ask if anyone had any items in the items by consensus that they wanted to be taken separately or w were we okay with moving with all of them forward okay great and Dr. McLeod 
Federico? I would move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. <laughs> hey. We're ready. Excellent. That's it. She's not going to read oh, them all. No, that's it. Wow. All right. So moved. I mean, idea. yeah, so moved. Yeah. Up until tonight. Second. Oh, <laughs> there you go. You take it. <laughs> we just need to set up an order for that. I know. That's all right. Motion by Ms. Birchman, seconded by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Yes, and it's unanimous, oh, and so carries. That was great. Can oh. I just thank you so much happen? for that? Oh, we discussed we it at the last that? meeting. Oh, that was lovely. I'm telling you, at this always at this time of the night when I'm reading. Five minutes. Oh yeah, yeah. But I thank you so much for nice. for considering that change. Which is why I asked if anyone wanted to take anything separately. Well, I, I thought that, that was just normal, but I didn't realize that. Um, yes, that was but I was bad about it. So at this time, we'll seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> motion by Ms. Birchman, seconded by Ms. Kavanaugh. All those in favor? Yes. 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 It's unanimous and so carries. And our next meetings, um, our, our summer special meetings, our first one will be Thursday, July 21st at 4 p.m. in the um, admin administration office conference room. And our second one will be Thursday, August 18th, also at 4 p.m. in the administrative conference room. And good night.